Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the London Business School and our eighth session in the series Gaining Ecosystem Advantage. Welcome to everyone who's new and welcome to everyone who's returning. I'm here with my esteemed colleague, Professor Michael Yakabides, who is a world authority on the topic of ecosystems, publishing in all the best places, including Strategic Management Journal, Harvard Business Review and elsewhere, and recently has been awarded uh, by Thinkers50, one of the world's top management thinkers. So congratulations for that and everything you do, Michael. And, and it's been an absolute pleasure working with you on this series and other things. So congratulations and welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure to be with you and to uh, be with Keith. But uh, David, we want to introduce uh, Keith before we take it away. Indeed, yes. So Keith is the interim CEO of The Guardian and the former COO of Channel 4 and previous roles in other media places, including Sky and Discovery. Keith, you are most welcome today. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Great. So we are going to talk about the media, funnily enough, The Guardian. Let's just give it, paint the picture before we dive into questions. As a remember, this is get ready because we are looking forward to your comments, questions. We want to make this as interactive as possible. So The Guardian was formed 200 years ago, and it's clearly evolved from being a very successful national newspaper to a multi-platform, multi-country, multi-format, high-quality journalism that makes money too. Um, it has recently announced a new strategic plan to grow reader engagement and reader revenues and has had a cracking time um, during the pandemic. I think if you look, if you, whether you're a reader or not, there's no shortage of news stories and there's no shortage of reader engagement. Um, so today we are going to talk about how to nurture and manage ecosystems in the world of news, both within the organisation and indeed outside. My own background is one of a practitioner. Media is one of my soft spots, if I may say so. Keith and I have known each other for a few years, even though our youthful looks would say otherwise. I've worked on partnerships, JVs in TV, radio, music, news and elsewhere, and I've absolutely loved it. So I'm particularly, if I may say so, looking forward to this discussion. So perhaps, Michael, I can ask you to sort of set the scene in terms of the bigger picture before we dive Indeed. into the, uh, the Guardian. Indeed. And I think that the bigger picture here, and I'm uh, taking... Uh, a bit of my uh, more recent interest, having shifted from someone who works primarily to help um, organizations think through their own strategies, uh, to someone who spent a bit of time thinking about regulating platforms and ecosystems, partly because of the power that a few of the strong uh, and important players have. And this is something that gets as serious as anything does for our society and our collective future. The reason is the following. We uh, rely, most uh, of uh, the societies in the world today rely in some form of democracy. And one of the things that democracy needs in order to operate is a reasoned understanding of the news that affects the views of voters, that affects the actions of politicians. Now, we used to have that with its own potential issues and pathologies and um, everyone will have read their own stories about Fleet Street and um, about how different um, editors and different newspapers played a big role, but all of that started changing a few years ago. And the reason is that what we have seen as a result of the growth of the big uh, platform firms is that there was a massive displacement. The displacement was not only in terms of what we do and where we spend our time. We spend our times uh, buried in Facebook or LinkedIn and Instagram and Twitter, as opposed to reading newspapers and magazines. But also, this is where advertising revenue goes. In the UK, the Competition Market Authorities had last year a thorough investigation of digital advertising. And what we saw in terms of digital advertising is that um, a couple of companies, Google and Facebook in particular, had more than two thirds in the EU of what digital advertising spend is, leaving the traditional media with something like 5% of the total pie. Now that's important because the ads that used to exist was the financial lifeblood that allowed the newspapers to take um, uh, revenue and to turn it into uh, coverage of events, perhaps sometimes biased, but it was what it was. And this is what kept um, people working uh, in news organizations. So right now we are in a new landscape. And of course, anyone who's walked, seen the results of the last five years 
understands that one of the side effects of social media is that unlike newspapers, it's much more polarizing because it creates echo chambers that you don't even know. When you read the Sun or you read the Times, you read the Financial Times, you kind of know where each one stands. The Guardian has had a very long standing view of things, and we kind of know that the Guardian will have a view which is consistent with its history. If you go on Facebook, you don't know that what you're looking at is an echo chamber of people who seem to act like you, and you think that this is reality. So here we're going to these interesting innovations that are altering both the information we receive and our understanding of the bias or the lack of bias, or as some people may be lulled into believing, of the stuff that we see. And that is a big challenge. So let me start with that. Keith, you've been living in an industry that has been transformed. Before we go in The Guardian and before we see how one individual organization was able to overcome this and try to work with technology rather than thinking that technology is only the foe, can you give us a sense of what are the changes that have happened in the media landscape and in news organizations like yours, but not focusing only on Guardian, as a result of the big platforms uh, and ecosystems that they have created? Yeah, of course. And, and I guess what we're talking about here is the big, big challenges and the themes and the shifts in the market that many companies are dealing with at the moment. And those are ones of digitalization and globalization. And with that, really that need to provide content in multiple formats and multiple platforms, which I'll come back to. I mean, gone, as you rightly described, Michael, gone are the days in which high distribution costs create a barrier to otherwise localized markets in which consumption is limited to one or two platforms. So I guess the Guardian, but just more generally, businesses are now dealing with a complex corporate digital transformation in um, an increasingly global market with low barriers to entry, where that competition for attention or eyeballs is higher than it has been forever before. And you rightly make the point that most of those eyeballs or many of those eyeballs are on these dominant digital platforms, which, you know, if we're being frank, fail to account for their responsibility as content publishers, but actually also have a very strong commercial incentive to promote content, which actually, as you use the word polarize, you, you polarizes, I think, public debate. Um, so look, it's clear we face a number of challenges. And I think like many other businesses, in a nutshell, our response to that is we're focusing on providing a high quality product, in our case, journalism, developing a strong brand and a trusted set of digital products through which our consumers can really establish a deep, trusted and profitable relationship with us. So I think there are really you know, many reasons to be optimistic and specifically so at The Guardian. I mean, I, I think, as you say, there are profound challenges, but no business has a guaranteed right to survive. Everyone has to evolve and innovate in order to sustain a market position. And if I, if I take our business, we have a, a really great product, a great brand, an engaged and loyal audience, and the financial firepower to invest in growth. And I think that's a great hand to play, even in a really challenging market. I think we've just got to play it well. It's great to hear some optimism and confidence about your own organisation. That's fantastic. And uh, as a reader, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Just going back up a level just for a moment about the industry, um, and some of the ecosystems. What, um, although there are <coughs> challenges, you talked about polar. Both of you talked about polarization um, as a topic around some of the platforms. But what positive impact have some of the platforms had on more traditional news organisations? Well, no, there's, there, I mean, there's no question. I think if you were to summarise our relationship status with the platforms, I'd probably put down complex. Um, I mean, clearly that, you know, there's a, there's a positive impact on the platforms of driving reach, bringing new audiences to our platforms, you know, giving us that distribution. And also, um, in many respects, you know, major platforms also help us with the monetization. So on that one hand, we have a hugely respectful set of commercial relationships. And in recent, um, in recent months, David, you'll be well aware of the fact that in, to some extent prompted by regulatory pressure, but uh, the Guardian and other news organizations have also started to conclude licensing deals, which start, emphasis on start, we start to recognize the value 
that journalism brings to their platforms in terms of that authority um, and also the engagement layer that we provide as well. So we've got a real multifaceted relationship with the platforms commercially, which is a massive, massive benefit. Um, mm. However, obviously, they do present challenges commercially as well. Um, Michael talked about the fact that you know, they've got a very, very dominant position in advertising. And they also really do, I think, strive to commoditize a lot of inventory where that, that context, that brand safe environment, I think, in, in really doesn't kind of get the premium it warrants at the moment. So th there's a slight commoditization there that I think represents a danger to quality, um, quality inventory and quality sites. But as I say, we've got a, um, a relatively complex relationship. We will always argue through the editorial that those, those platforms, given that they hold such massive economic and societal power, that governments do have a duty to encourage transparency, to set a level playing field, and just generally to hold those powerful platforms to account, whilst at the same time, we can continue to evolve the model and continue to have constructive commercial relationships. And I think that's absolutely right within a complex ecosystem that you can argue both sides. Let me just ask you um, on, on this one, uh, one final question before we start looking at what The Guardian does um, positively in order to see how it can add value given the landscape, whatever the landscape is. Now, um, first of all, uh, it, it, it is quite fun in, a, in Facebook terms, you know, relationship, it's complicated, I guess, that what we would put in the, in the little box. But um, in the it's complicated, I wanted to think um, about what the potential role of uh, regulation is. We've seen in recent discussions in Australia and in France that there have been a number of efforts to try to redress that, right? And try to see whether we can come to some um, um, understanding of uh, supporting uh, journalism. And clearly it has been the most uh, respected organizations that have been more progressive and able to defend themselves, and The Guardian is certainly one of them. How far do you think that appropriate regulatory or governmental um, sort of push can um, go to redress part of this balance? And what will it consist of? I mean, is it going to be something that is going to be uh, rules of the game that need to be global? There has been a lot of discussion, and initially, at least, you know, the big tech players were quite skeptical when uh, particular um, countries said decided to change in especially you know the the rate the, the terms through which um, they post uh, news that come from news organizations how do you think um, that uh, efforts that we as a society are going to take are going to affect the relative balance of power between the big tech ecosystem and the media ecosystem, and then we'll turn to the media ecosystem next. Well, no, in, ter in terms of the, um, the value equation, as I say, I mean, we have, we have had for quite some time a series of really, really constructive, healthy commercial relationships with various different platforms. I think there is a sense, though, that, you know, we're, given the imbalance of power between those platforms and organisations like ourselves, and also smaller organisations, there was a need for regulatory intervention to reflect the value that journalism brings to those platforms, as I say, to build its authority and to build the engagement, which it ultimately relies upon to build an ad business. And I think some of that regulation is likely to come in very local forms. I mean, you've got the ACCC intervention in Australia uh, in terms of the news bargaining code, I think was absolutely pivotal in striving forward some commercial deals, which have then started actually quite a groundswell and led to some other deals in other territories where now, Again, news organisations are starting to get a funding agreement and a licensing agreement in place, whereby those funds can be reinvested in journalism and support the broader ecosystem. I think that's a good start, and I'm optimistic about what, the, what can be achieved as well as the digital market unit starts to get established in the UK and starts to gain scale and impact. So I think we'll see various different initiatives come forward at various different territories as they gain pace. Um, I think at some point there'll need to be a global coordination layer, but I think it's more, much more likely to be territory by territory at this, at this early stage of development. And I think we're making good progress, but these things take a long, long time. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot to be learned from the Australian case study that we saw only a few months ago. 
uh, sorry for, for pressing on this one because it's it's a fascinating um, detail though. Um, so you are saying, if I understand it right, that some of uh, the individual countries create templates that may essentially de facto affect things well outside their territories so that the Australian market, which is quite a small market if you look at the total readership and the money involved, may end up ha having a much greater impact in as much as it unlocks things that are modeled around it. And in that regard, we may be optimistic in as much as this sets implicit standards, even if they're not sort of universally policed and part of a globally accepted code of conduct in terms of the way that media um, it connects to uh, the social media and the posting that happens there, if I get it right. Yeah, no, what I guess my point is, is that different regulatory authorities in different markets um, have the opportunity to observe how developments are actually taking place in alternative territories and see how companies are responding to those. So my observation is, is that in Australia, where, as I say, I think they took a particularly a progressive approach with the news bargaining code um, pushed forward by the ACCC, which had a profound effect in the relationships between news organisations and the dominant platforms in that territory. I think there are a lot of regulatory authorities outside of Australia who have looked at the impact of that legislation, have looked at the learnings and looked at how platforms and indeed the news providers responded to it. And I think that will then serve to shape their own regulatory interventions as they look to apply those within their own territories. So I think it's, uh, I think it's a case of learning from other markets like we do in business. I imagine the regulatory authorities do the same. Yeah, it's interesting that, that point that if you look at other media markets and you look at other issues that have come up in competition regulation policy, such as sports rights deals going back, the role and funding of public service broadcasting, the relationship with independent producers, all the topics that you and I, Keith, have known and loved, They've started typically with a single action by a government or an authority and others have then either learned or coordinated, but it does, it does take time. And that's the challenge that, you know, the markets move very quickly and often the authorities, and this is a topic we talked about in a previous session, take a long time to, to learn. Um, but, you know, the dynamics that Michael eloquently described are not exactly going to wait for an authority. So there is something about pace of learning, both right. the news organizations and the authorities coordinating at speed. Um, Which is why I think balance. you have a you have one has a dual approach there. I mean, one has a, obviously there's a, a lobbying and a regulatory strategy. But again, it, one needs to foster very, very strong, very productive commercial relationships as well that can underpin that as well. Which is why, again, it's a complex relationship. I agree. So Roman's asked a good question. He says, what's your view on new subscription platforms like Substack and how will they influence the media landscape? Is that something that's come across your bow? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, I mean, this really looks at the um, the disintermediation, I guess, of journalism provides alternative means for journalists to actually monetize their proposition. I would say for us, though, really, the, the Guardian is really focused on optimizing those key strengths that I actually said it had, which is a, you know, fantastic, a fantastic brand itself, um, excellent journalists, um, and a really loyal and engaged readers with the money to invest. So, I think Substack and others like it, other direct models, actually have a role to play in the news ecosystem. Yeah. But as I actually reflect on the kind of core strength and the capabilities that we can then bring and leverage within the market, I actually think the opportunities are really, really strong. I mean, two things, David, I would just say that really surprised me when I joined the business from Channel 4 are really the extent to which it, um, it is a global business. I think you touched on that at your beginning. Um, and also that, that real success of the contributions model. And so if I just think about mm -hmm. the, the, um, the sort of the international nature of the business as well, you alluded to it, but 30% of total revenue and 50% of digital re revenues are now from outside of the UK. And, you know, I truly believe there is big, big scope to grow those figures as you look at our, the, the opportunity within our current base of the US and Australia and then some of the other markets where we've got a very substantial presence, but don't actually have a physical presence. Um, the other area is that ability to grow contributions, and that talks to our switch into this more reader, reader-centric model. Um, we do think that really by investing in the journalism, by investing in the products, by investing in our core data capabilities, we can create that virtuous cycle that means that we can invest 
again, more in the journalism and start to augment that relationship. So I, look, you look at, you look at what thing, uh, platforms like Substack are doing and new entrants into the market, and what they are doing is showing that consumers are increasingly willing to pay for high quality news. Um, and I think when you align that, they are particularly willing to, uh, to pay if I think they believe that there's a purpose and a cause behind that journalism, which they can align to. So, um, mm. yeah, look, I think reasons to be optimistic, therefore, are consumers are increasingly willing to pay, one. Advertisers are increasingly looking for brand-safe, um, trusted environments with businesses with strong values with which they can align. And as, you, as we discussed earlier, I think nudged on by regulation, I think platforms are also willing to make contributions, increasing contributions in recognition of the value that journalism applies to their businesses, both in terms of engagement, but also in terms of that authority. So, I mean, Michael rightly identified a series of very profound challenges for the business. But I think when you look at those trends that are emerging, willingness to pay from consumers, advertisers and platforms, Again, that's a hand that I think now it's just a case of playing that hand well, and we can create a real, engaging, profitable, virtuous model for the news industry. So if I may try to play back some of the things that I heard, Keith, um, my understanding is the following. Um, there used to be an old license to operate, which was based on the fact that you had to take news, well, you would only choose um, between the news providers that you were dealt with. And if The Guardian was better than its peers, well, that was kind of that. Then that got challenged uh, because people said, well, we don't even need newspapers. And I think that now what we're seeing is, well, people need to find a way of aggregating news with some shape or form or another. So the very reason that newspapers emerge in the first place is now being rediscovered, <laughs> surprise, surprise. And people say that we're going to find some digital ways of putting it together. And you're like, well, in this new landscape, which by the way, it's just the re-rendering of what existed there and was at the base of uh, their emergence in the first place, we may be able to add value. The thing is that we need to compete with many more players and we need to find a way of making sure that the client uh, gets the benefit. Now, there's two issues that I would like to explore. One of them is who exactly is the client? Because the problem, uh, and anyone who's been watching, for instance, the most recent Facebook um, uh, revelation uh, that has seen is that if the client is the individual user and the amount of time that they spend there, whether that ends up leading them to commit suicide because their body image isn't quite what it should be, um, or be depressed, um, uh, or because they get excited because they got overstimulated in an addictive way, or that is providing good quality content, you know, is in the eyes of the beholder. So is the customer uh, only the uh, what uh, drives stickiness to one individual site? So this is sort of part one, this big challenge that you have as a news organization of seeing, well, yes, I clearly want to do something that is going to work for my customer, but at the same time, I need to find some way of ensuring that I maintain some standards. And the second thing is to say, well, at least on the good news is that I need to provide something that people will identify the value add of, and then I'll see how I can cut across different channels, I can find the different tidbits and customize it to what individuals will want. So I would like to um, ask you to think about either of the two, whether it is you want to start with this big challenge that a news organization has, which is to be customer centric, but not exclusively focusing on what creates extra time on the platform, as it were. And the second thing is, and how can you be the you know newspaper 2.0 or news organization 2.0 that starts integrating into the offering the kind of stuff that add value i think we'll want to cover both so you know let's start with one and i'm sure david will uh, uh continue with uh, whatever has um has been left uh, untouched yeah i mean let me let me just come to that i guess the the premise of the question i guess michael the only thing i might just challenge i guess is that 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 
potentially a false choice you've just presented there between going after the reader and also sort of producing the sort of the high quality journalism or um, uh, because I, I, I would say for us, our, our model there is we are obviously a sort of journalistic first organization. We want to produce, we want to create an environment where the best journalists can come here and produce their best work. And we want to create the underlying business capabilities within those non-editorial teams to make sure that we can distribute and monetize that content to reinvest into the journalism. Now, of course, that, that high quality, impactful, informative journalism that enables us, you know, society to have a well-informed debate, that appeals to our readers. And, so, and it also reinforces our brand, which encourages our readers to support us and creates a set of values with which advertisers want to be associated. So I, I, I'm always slightly wary when, um, when people make the decision of, you know, do you drive for mass engagement, the sort of the click base argument, because again, that would be a very short termist approach, because of course, what we would then serve to do is undermine our brand. And I think brand and values are really important in the type of market, uh, Michael, as you, as you describe, which is, overwhelming choice of news or articles of different quality and I think in that paradox of choice as is well researched people tend towards what is familiar or what is trusted and I think in that environment it's key that brands do create a, a very trusted brand environment for readers to come to and I think that's what the Guardian is doing we we make short-term sacrifices I think in, in return for long-term value of our brand and also long-term uh, long value in relation to our values. Just a couple of examples of that are, we have a, um, I mean, we have a reader first data privacy policy. Um, where obviously that means we leave some advertising money on the table. We have a, a, a general ad policy where we don't accept money from fossil fuel advertisers, which of course leaves value on the table. But we do that because we think that's right. That's in line and strategically coherent, which is um, that coherence is, I know, is a subject that uh, David is very, uh, has some significant expertise on. But that coherence is really important when you need to stay true to your brand. You need to stay true to your values. And I think just as importantly in a purpose led organization, you need to demonstrate internally to those who come and work for you because of those values that you are making decisions that are very, very coherent and strategically aligned. So um, I think, yeah, that's how I would, that's how I would respond to that question. I mean, the big shift that you've both been talking about is that shift to reader first, which sounds easy to say, but it's hard to, to execute. And if you look, if you go back over this series, one of the big themes that we've been talking about is ecosystem orchestrators um, have focused on consumers, in this case, readers first, their needs, expectations, and so on, and then work back um, to, to what they do. But I guess one of the differences is, and we've heard from, you know, one of our previous guests was uh, Jonathan Larson from Ping Ang. They have extended quite substantially in their, their, from their space in financial services to others um, growing. I guess what you're saying, Keith, is you have to be, given the position of the Guardian, the trust you have, you have to make quite difficult and conscious choices about how far to extend either by product, well, and to a degree geography, because, you know, the question is the depth of journalism um, that you can actually offer. So if you're going to a global readership, they will want the brand to stand for, not frankly, just a UK perspective on what's going on elsewhere. So it's a pretty difficult strategic and I guess also operational choices about how far you extend. Yeah, I guess, let me, let me just, touch on the point though that you made about the reader centric model because I, I guess that is and certainly I use it quite a lot within the Guardian it's probably quite important just to emphasize um, what I mean by that fundamentally that is about believing that impactful high quality journalism can be the basis of a profitable business model I think that's that's the essence of what I mean by the, the reader centric yes. switch and I'll just bring that to life a second I mean we as I said we want to create that virtuous cycle where High quality journalism is consumed or must have products, which are then form deep, deep relationships with our readers, who are then motivated to support us financially, and then creates the funds for investment in that journalism. Yes. And that is a shift. I mean, that is a shift in the business model because it was the view um, some years back 
that journalism was necessarily loss making and that it needed to be subsidized by ancillary investments that would come back and fund the news organization. And so what I really mean is now in this reader centric model, we are deprioritizing the sort of, if you like that ancillary corporate development activity. We are focusing in on the core business, the core business of journalism. And we are then becoming certainly across the non-editorial elements of the business, much more reader centric to make sure that we understand our readers better, that we are able to create products that surprise and delight, that we're able to use sophisticated data analytics in order to then continue to develop that deep and trusted relationship with those audiences such that we can then do the classic things of monetizing um, readers in a more sophisticated way, much, much better uh, conversion rates, a better focus on retention, and offering them a product which does actually fulfill more of their needs. And that's, that's what I mean by a reader-centric model. It's much more about believing that the journalism can be profitable, therefore working on packaging that journalism in a way yep. that can drive a profitable business model going forward. And I think, as you said, look, we are starting to see the success of that. Um, last year, we had record readership, um, the, the 2 billion uniques that you mentioned, record digital revenues um, and obviously significantly improved cash flow. And I would, I would dare to suggest that we will actually have an even better financial performance this year. So really within the business, it's that common goal of protecting Guardian journalism into perpetuity. And I think that is that mission that binds everyone in the business. and just means that we are now really focused, certainly across the non-editorial teams, on making sure that we're in a position to create that virtuous cycle and that's where we're focusing. It's not assuming that news is loss making and we need to invest elsewhere. Terrific. So essentially what, what we're saying here is that the solution to this conundrum of do we um, find some way of not having a potential conflict between the high quality journalism um, and um, uh, the provision of what people want is that we are offering a seriously curated um, um, set of material on the basis of the creation of both a better product and an identity that is consistent with values and principles. That takes me to the observation uh, or question that Viju uh, Parameshwar had in, has in our chat. So Viju says, with global online readership, high quality and trustworthy papers like the New York Times, Washington Post and The Guardian could, should, dominate the business while either local papers die off as their ad revenues uh, drop off. Now, there's both a descriptive, do you agree, um, and a prescriptive, um, is this the way that we should be heading and the creation of a few important nodes which will have both the scope and the wherewithal in terms of the resources needed to provide such um, um, services in terms of journalism uh, while inescapably uh, displacing some others. What do you think about that? Um, well, no, I think this is in many respects has parallels with my experience in the in the TV market, actually, which is in, in an env market environment where distribution is obviously not the scarce resource it was and therefore the barriers to entry are lower. Obviously, you've got bigger players who are looking at international markets as a means of expanding their businesses. So as, as you rightly say, we've got big US players at the moment looking at the UK or more generally Europe as a means to expand in the same way that Disney, Netflix looks across the globe as a means to expand their content offer, their very strong content offering as well. What I would, what I would just say about that though is I, I think with the right tailored proposition, with the right understanding of your audience, there is room for those big global providers to, um, to coexist with local players who have got that real understanding of their audience, who have got that emphasis on local stories or in the case of TV, local programs. And so I think both parties can exist. I think what, what it drives everyone to do is to really focus on what their competitive advantage is and what their strengths are and to really understand their audiences and find their place in the market. Um, I think it really does cause a problem for those in the middle ground. But as you say, I think at the moment, the way the market is, is developing, digitalization, globalization, low barriers to entry, 
that means, yes, big players, including The Guardian, are looking to expand internationally. But I also think local propositions can really serve their audiences very, very well. And, you know, you've only got to look at the share price bounce back of Reach PLC and how their results are going at the moment to notice the success they're having in, in, um, in local markets. That's a great, that's a great example. I agree. And in terms of the, but it has to be high quality, differentiated, and it has to be on platforms because people search costs are, have reduced. People can find it and or and if they don't like it, the tension spans are quick and they'll switch. Switching costs are reduced. I mean, but just that, about, and, and I think you've got the you've got the. Sorry to interrupt you, David. I think you've no, got please. absolute parallels um, there. In I mean, I alluded to it very very briefly, but in the TV market, I mean, people. I, I would say my old employer, Channel Four. People have been talking about the profound challenges faced by that business because of. Um, you know, the, the introduction into the markets of very, very well-funded global streaming services. And there's yeah. no doubt that presents a challenge, but you also look at the sophistication within which the business is being run and that it does have a very good understanding of its audience base. It knows its position in the market and it's able to put out a range of excellent programs that really do appeal to people that yeah. I think therefore gives it, uh, you know, sustainability for a very, very long time to come as a result of, that local market positioning um, and a really distinctive content offer. I agree. So everyone, we've got just under 10 minutes to go and I'm, I'm now expecting, I think we're all expecting a flurry of incisive uh, questions, but as you're warming yourselves up, um, one th I guess I wanted to just shift now to the internal dynamics of, of the Guardian and uh, the internal ecosystem, because if going back to your examples there, the Netflix of the world and the other streamers have effectively used um, viewer insight and fed it back into the commissioning process and the their editorial process in different shapes and form. Um, that's a big shift for a news organisation where the journalists were the, if you like, the, the dominant players, their opinions counts. And of course, they want to represent the lives and the, the, the dynamics of their readers. But how has that shifted, Keith, in terms of you have a reader-centric view that you've articulated very clearly, but that's a big shift in the dynamics with the journalists who now have readers wanting to, I guess, express more opinions, feed in stories themselves. How has that internal picture changed in the, in the, in the, in the dynamics you just described? Um, no, I mean, there's obviously within the, um, as you know, Dave, within The Guardian, my role is not... Um, to shape the editorial. The editorial teams obviously work um, are very, very separate from the commercial influence and they are there to write um, excellent stories about the news agenda of the day and to shape that public debate, which I think they do excellently. Um, in terms of, you know, in terms of how that shapes out at the moment, we, in a reader-centric organisation, we are effectively more united uh, within the business in terms of wanting to augment and grow that journalism because it is it is ultimately the product of the business. Um, all parts of the business want to promote the creation of outstanding journalism. Journalism which motivates um, readers to contribute and support and which also motiv uh, sorry, promotes a set of values with which advertisers want to associate their brand. Mm. Um, so again, back to that slight conflict which Michael alluded to earlier, we, 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 we don't want to be putting out content, of course, that is clickbait, because ultimately we get long-term sustainable value from adhering to a set of brand values and appealing to a set of readers that would expect more from a news organisation like The Guardian. Um, and therefore, this, for me, the senior editorial team is just as interested in having a sustainable model supported by readers as I am in having more opportunity to fund and augment the great journalism that we already produce. So, I, I think, to be honest, this is about creating a culture where both sides of the organisation can come in and do their very, very best work and deliver to that promise. So let me just take that because, um, you know, we have heard about the, um, the uh, reader first um, and the focus on providing something that really works for them. Um, in what ways is this promise being delivered? Because as a principle, it sounds great. But what is it? Is it just predictive analytics in terms of what pieces people will want? Is it assessing what attracts people's attention and then deciding that you're going to do more of that? What is it that it, it really consists of? 
and uh, is it um, focused primarily on the protection and the customization? And the second bit is how does that affect what it is that you do, the content that the Guardian um, either provides or the way that it polishes it uh, and shares it more broadly? Yeah, I, I would answer that from the perspective of um, obviously the non-editorial, because as I say, that's where the shift is. That's where really the emphasis on reader-centric comes due to this fundamental belief that news can be profitable. So where I'm reader-centric, as opposed to being um, focused on ancillary investments, is really around making sure that we are investing in products that are reader-centric, which house our news in a way that is engaging, in a way that drives stickiness with our product, and in a way that basically gives people the value such that they're motivated to support. In still an open model, which obviously many people within the industry didn't think would work, and is now generating you know, almost 70 million pounds for the business. So that's the type of thing that I mean by a, a reader-centric model. It's, it's creating, it's looking at the product that we have, which is you know, fantastic world-class journalism across a broad range of genres. And it's then about thinking, how do we package that such that it maximizes engagement? How do we create and augment that with fantastic underlying business capabilities, a data platform to make sure we can really understand and have meaningful communications and a deep and trusted relationship with our audience, such that then we can effectively convert and retain those who want to pay for that journalism and then reinvest it back in the business. That, from a non-editorial stance, is focused on the reader. Um, and I think that is a seismic change within the business. The journalists, obviously, they, are, they, they have more than enough tools to know who is, um, who is reading, their, uh, reading the journalism. But I think within an organization such as The Guardian, um, we want the journalists to be able to follow the stories develop the stories and set the news agenda. And I think that I, I wouldn't want to suggest for any one opinion that is effectively uh, journalism by numbers. That's absolutely not. Hmm. What I'm Effectually, referring to really is the shift yeah. in the non-editorial model. Yeah. But even so, the, you know, the, the fact that they are bought into and coherent with that overall reader-centric view will mean that they'll have more of an eye to what you described and they'll use the tools as they want. And it's not a, they're, not, they're not walking algorithms, uh, if right. you like. Um, I mean, one thing that as we as we draw to a close, one thing that obviously many organizations are grappling with in, in a world of ecosystems is how to deliver profit and a greater sense of purpose. Obviously, you're doing that. So for people watching, listening to this, you know, this discussion, Keith, what what sort of last piece of advice would you give to people as they try and, if you like, marry, deliver on both in a world that going back to our earlier conversation is more complex in its relationships with stronger platforms but you said you can do both so what would be your one or two nuggets of wisdom on on how to do that if you're somebody else listening into this conversation good challenge david very good challenge um well look, i i think this is about making sure that the strategy is aligned and uh, importantly coherent with the values of the business um this this point that i made earlier which is in a world of increasing competition consumers will gravitate to those trusted brands with which they have a a, a shared set of values i think i think that's that's true and therefore businesses have to be very careful they have to be careful to ensure that they and i think to michael's earlier point the partners within which they use within the ecosystems behave in a manner which are consistent with those values because that mm. trust as we all know right it's hard won but it's very easily lost so yeah. as i think about yeah. one of our revenue streams in advertising there's there's no point having a, a privacy first approach to data on your own if you then go and uh, syndicate your platforms uh, syndicate your content rather to platforms that don't or if yes. you use a programmatic ad partner that yeah. has no such concern for uh, for consumer data so I would just say the expectations on purpose-driven organizations such as ourselves, such as Channel 4, are high, both externally and internally. Um, and it does mean you ne need to therefore work very, very hard on that element of coherence and I think communication, communication with your staff as well, so that you can really articulate why certain decisions are made, how that fits with the certain values of the organization. And you can demonstrate that you know those are important because that's why the best talent is coming to work for purpose-driven organizations Wonderful. 
which Michael. basically tells us tells us that uh, when it comes to digital disruption um, and a platform uh, based digital disruption strategy and uh, communication of this strategy, both internally and externally, is uh, a big part of the answer, both for having an individual organization that succeeds, but also delivering on the mission um, that is important. And the mission here has huge societal impacts as well. So thank you very much for a really rich conversation, um, uh, Keith, and for everyone else. Um, we look forward to seeing you in three weeks when we'll be speaking with Benedict Evans, the iconic tech analyst, uh, mm -hmm. when we'll be trying to figure out whether uh, big tech will be uh, potentially curtailed by current regulation or whether that will have to wait for the true uh, part of Web 3.0. But with that, Keith, it's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you, Thank Keith. You so Thank much. you, everyone, Thank for you. joining in your question. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Thank you.